Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is John Kessel, whose latest release is The Dark Ride, the best short, the best short fiction of himself, <laughs> published by <laughs> Subterranean Press. It'll be released on June 1st. John's the author of Pride and Prometheus, which is actually in this book in its short story form, and now it's a novel. Also, uh, The Moon and the Other, Good News from Outer Space, Corrupting Mr. Nice, and of course, tons of short stories. He's received the Nebula Award twice with a galactic distance of time between each. Um, <laughs> he's married to the author, Therese Ann Fowler, whose latest, It All Comes Down to This, which very sweetly will be released on June 7th, just six days after this one. Um, John's a contemporary of mine. We were, we were just talking about it. So it was great fun in reading The Dark Ride and see the many, many memories we share from my uh, altered state when I was listening to the fire sign theaters. Don't crush that dwarf. <laughs> can't even put pliers. Uh, but, you know, and I just was starting to listen to it again while I should have been researching this. And it's so funny. Um, to Clifford Simak, and they walked like men, but I say Waystation is better. Um, and I was 11 at that time. And then the double features at the movies, Vincent Price, you know, Theater of Blood, Scream and Scream Again. Um, so- the Tingler. Yeah, the Tingler, I was the best to pull it <laughs> off the spine. Uh, my brother loved that. Uh, so yeah, so you got the, the Dark Rye, which starts not responsible, Park and Lockett, which is from Fire Sign. And then you got the dark ride at the end and they're sandwiching 18 other stories. And also Kim Stanley Robinson, one of my heroes and one of his, it writes a great introduction, which compares John's writing. And I'll, we can talk about this in the story. It's the Kafka, Calvino, I think of Cosmic Comics, Borges, like the Library of Babel and um, so many others. Anyway, hi, John. And thanks so much for being with me today. Hi, hi. I'm very pleased to be here. Yeah. I I'm happy to talk about this book and anything else. Oh, yeah, okay. I'll talk about something because um, it's in your blog. Did you really get your tongue stuck on that metal pole? <laughs> I got it stuck on a doorknob. Yeah, it was a weird thing because you know, someone said, you know, you can't, if you get your tongue on something metal, it'll get stuck there. I said, really? You know, and so I put my tongue on the doorknob of our house and it was stuck there. <laughs> there, was, there was a kid in my neighborhood who did it at the railroad tracks got his oh tongue my God. and this doesn't sound very good but because a train could be coming anytime his friend peed on his tongue <laughs> and that's how he got it off okay well you know <laughs> resourcefulness <laughs> and the other thing is uh that i remember is is uh swimming nude at the ymca which you did <laughs> kind of and I was the only yeah. white guy there, so I was kind of an inferiority complex. Oh, wow. That, uh, yeah, I don't understand what they thought they were doing then. It was really strange. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like, you know, stories of men. They were turning you into men, I guess. I guess so. You know, it's weird. Uh, the past, as someone said, the past is another country. They do things differently there. Uh, I think it was L.P. Hartley who said that. And so that, that, that's true, okay? The 1950s, you know, that was the middle of the last century. And, uh, uh, you know, things are different. Yeah. Um, for the good and bad. Well, we can't go through all the stories since we can't. It's too many. We could, but we'd be here for, you know, the rest of the day. <laughs> but the one thing I was saying to you at the beginning was, first I started reading, I go, why don't they put the dates on these stories? And then when I realized you had the notes, I think for someone who hasn't read you or people who have read, it's great that you put the dates and also the kind of ideas you had when you were starting the story. So why don't we start with, we can do the two, the first in the beginning, uh, first in the end. So talk about, um, cause it's an interesting story how this got written, yeah. um, not responsible park and lock it. Well, that's a, you know, that is the uh, oldest story that's in the book. I I'd published a few stories before that, that are probably deservedly forgotten. But uh, um, I remember when I wrote it, I thought, oh, this is the first really good story I've ever written. And uh, it, um, 
You know, it came out of an odd circumstance. I, I, I have uh, notes at the end of the book uh, for each of the stories, and, and it was fun to write those. But yeah, that one came out of uh, a situation where uh, a friend of mine named Tim Roth uh, wrote a story in which people is all sort of an ordinary American family living in a world where they live all of their lives in their, their automobile driving. Uh, on a big super highway, and uh, no one, no one ever stops. And it, it talked about the the childhood of this hero growing up in this family. And uh, I thought it was a wonderful story. Uh, Tim and I were were friends at the University of Kansas when I was in grad school, and uh, he was an aspiring fiction writer. He liked science fiction, did a lot of weird stuff. And uh, then he had a, you know, a terrible experience in a workshop we were both in. Uh, and I could go into the details of that. Uh, uh, the, the workshop was run by James Gunn, who, my mentor, a uh, uh, longtime science fiction writer, just died of, of, of 2020, I believe, at the age of 97, and uh, um, a grandmaster in science fiction. So he was he was a, a good guy and he ran this workshop and he knew everybody in the world of science fiction. So he would bring science fiction writers, real science fiction writers to campus to give readings and, and to sometimes teach the workshop. So he brought this very famous writer there to teach the workshop that week. And uh, the writer asked us all, each in the class, it was a very small class, it was only like six or seven people. I think it was all men. Uh, to write a story in one night. And then the next day uh, he would read the stories and, and we'd, he'd critique them. And so we each did that. And Tim wrote uh, a, a, a kind of a takedown of, of heroic fantasy about a, a young boy in the small town in the fantasy world that uh, uh, his town is challenged by uh, uh, the next town over, this brutal warrior guy who's a uh, abuse them and uh, and and this boy has the young man has to fight him in single combat for the honor of the town and his girlfriend and it's it's like every fantasy novel you've ever read or story where you know you have the young hero um you know like luke skywalker or uh, aragon who goes off and and fights the the evil uh a warrior and and invariably wins but in in, in although tim's story seemed to be following that that pattern in the end uh in the battle uh the guy is no good to to fight an experienced warrior and the guy beats the crap out of our hero and ends up pissing on him and taking his girlfriend and raping her and so it was really a dark ending on a story that you didn't think was going to have that so when we came into class to have the critique this famous science fiction writer when it came time to talk about tim's story just uh, ripped the story to shreds. He, he mocked it, he made fun of the characters' names, he waved the manuscript around and was dancing around the, the room and uh, making fun of this uh, kind of cliched fantasy stuff. And uh, it went on for like 20 minutes, it was brutal. All of us were cowering. Uh, and as he was going through this, I realized that he had not read all the way to the end of the story because he expected it to have the same ending that uh, you, you, the cliche story would have. And uh, but Tim was brutalized by this. And he, uh, after that, quit writing and dropped out of school, joined the army, washed out of basic training, came back to Lawrence, Kansas, which is the University of Kansas, and uh, became a, a born again Christian, was living with a bunch of other Christians in a house. And I, I, I you know, I, di I didn't see him after that. And uh, I was, uh, some years later, uh, 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 I remembered this other story he wrote about the people living in the automobiles, and I, I, I went over to the house where he was living, and I said, hey, Tim, uh, I hadn't seen him in years. Uh, how about, you know, you let, I'd like to, uh, I really like that story. I know you haven't published it. Suppose you give me the manuscript. I'll rewrite it as a collaboration. We'll try to get published. And he said he had destroyed all of his stories, that they represented a part of him he didn't really want to remember and uh and so he had no more of his stories so i asked him if i could write a story with the same idea and that's how i came to write not responsible uh that's a long story to how to how i got there no but, but it's interesting uh, because it reminded me you remember robert highland's story the rose bus roll yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. i thought of that when i was reading uh, that just because it was well boring. you know uh 
it's funny because my story is really different from Tim's in certain ways. I can hardly remember what Tim's was since mine sort of took its place. Uh, but, uh, but it really was that strangeness of very commonplace kind of ordinary middle-class American life with a completely absurd science fictional, but not really even science fictional, uh, uh, absurdist uh, 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 living situation where people are in the cars. And so inventing how, how would the kids go to school? Where would they get their food? Where were the people, do they sleep in the cars? Do they stop every night? It, was, it reminded me of you know, when we would go for a trip uh, with my parents in the car, me and my sister would be in the back seat and, and they'd be driving. It seemed forever. The cars, you know, high, top speed of 50 miles an hour in 1958, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, uh, stopping in, in uh, motels every night and that kind of thing. It sort of called it all back. When you said that, um, well, re this reminded me, when you said that um, you had to write a story in the night, you know that exercise that you teach your students about write a grammatically correct sentence and then like tee off of it in the second second se second sentence and then keep going from there. Yeah, I try I tried that after you said that and it's it's really good. I mean, it really works, doesn't it? It, it does. It's worked for me pretty much every time I've I've tried that. I've done a number of stories, probably two or three only, uh, where I did that. You know, because it sort of forces you to not worry too much about where you're going, at least at first. And, and you don't have to, you just sort of build grammatically from one sentence or one logical statement to another. And you don't really get writer's block because you have to write the next sentence, you know? No, no, you, you have to. Oh, I'm going to get photobombed here by my cat. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just the tail. Yeah. <laughs> That's out of a Robert Heinlein book too. <laughs> um, so the other interesting thing that you do is you, it's not just the story, you make these characters so, like in my book club, people are gonna go, well, that guy was an asshole. No, he wasn't, I thought he was good. It's like Carson in, this, in that story, um, yeah, uh, in the closet, the, yeah. He's, like, he's an asshole. I mean, the it's, mother and the daughter, the mother and the kid fall down, he doesn't even stop, he doesn't even think about it. Right. Right. But that's not that's has a, that's not the story. But then it also is kind of the story, you know? Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it's really about exposing his character and his his issues. Uh, uh, you know, that story to me is one of several stories I've written that is exploring a certain kind of masculinity. I mean, I suppose you could call Carson in that story a you know a, a victim of toxic masculinity, although the term wasn't really around that much when I wrote it. Uh, you know, he's a guy who who has uh, issues with being a man. Of course, it, then it has a very twisty ending to that. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, he's, he's defining uh, himself and being a man in a certain way that is not very positive uh, in my mind anyway. It's funny because there's so many goofy things you do, like when he shakes it out at the end and it's inside out. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> who the hell would think of, doing that but it really you know that's what would happen that's exactly what would happen because it happens with my clothes and i'm not going to not that it's really a spoiler but i'm not going to it away and the other thing what i was saying about characters is like you make me i mean in um in the first story the father is kind of you know you feel sorry from for him but he's also it's his fault too the way he is and then like little things like at the end of some like a cold i really felt bad for einstein i mean <laughs> poor einstein yeah, yeah i know and, and you know and then there's you know there's so many characters that have that kind of you know well okay the the saddest one and you even say it um is the is the motorman's coat which reminded me of again like kim says it reminded me of gogol and the overcoat you know it was the same, yeah. the same feeling. It was so sad, you know? Well, that story has a kind of Eastern European uh, feel to it because it, it's set in Prague and I had been in Prague and was thinking a lot about those kinds of stories, you know, the, those uh, uh, Slavic nations where they have this kind of melancholy uh, 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 characterization, but also funny at the same time, but, but sad. Um, um, you know, I, I, I don't try necessarily to, uh, I don't want my characters to be unsympathetic completely. I, I, I just want them to be human. And, uh, you know, I don't I very seldom have a character who's a, 
a paragon or a hero. I think I don't have anybody who's ever, I've ever had a character who's just a, a sort of without equivocation, a hero. Uh, but also I don't think I have anyone who's without equivocation a villain. I, I really see people as more complicated than that. And uh, it doesn't mean you can't have sympathy for someone who is deeply flawed. Uh, at least that's something I'd like to think about. Yeah, it's like um, Tyler. Tyler's his name, right? Tyler? Yes, Tyler in uh, Stories for Men, you mean? Yeah, yeah you kind of want to think, that's a good one you do because, well, first of all, it was written way back in the early 2000s. Right. Think how, how current it is now. It's it's so current. and you But half the people are going to think, guys are going to say, wow, he's a hero, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I've had people come to me after reading that story and saying, well, now are you advocating for Tyler's point of view there? And I say, I, I say, no, I'm not, but he has a couple of good points. Okay. So, so, you know, he, 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 his experience of the world is not to be ignored, but in the end, I think he's a terribly destructive person. Uh, uh, if and people who follow him are, I think are, are, uh, causing a lot of lot of real real damage and so you know i guess you could say that if if there's a villain there he's he certainly does some villainous things but he's also funny and he's also uh uh charismatic and isn't that the case with uh often uh people who do destructive things is they can be charismatic uh like our recently hopefully completely departed president uh, I, I, you know, uh, a lot of people love him to death and would, would follow him anywhere. Uh, and I think that's often the case with, uh, with people who, who, what? And then they, and then not only that, they often have some elements of truth in the things they're saying, but, uh, that doesn't make them positive forces in the world. Okay. Uh, and, and truth is complex. Uh, so, so yeah, Tyler to me was was again another example of a kind of masculinity that uh, that I think is attractive to young men, because my hero there is uh, Erno is a is a young guy, seventeen years old. So he you know he's looking for somebody, some male role model, been raised by his mother, and uh, in, in a world where mothers do all the raising, so he's rebelling and and he's looking for somebody, and Tyler offers him an, an opportunity to you know, what seems to be an attractive uh, role model, although I think by the end of the story, we realize, no, that's not, it's not a good idea. Well, when people buy this book, it'll be in my, my bookshop, both, both your wife's and my book, your book will be in my bookshop next, no, in June. Um, but uh, when they read about Erno, that's not the end of Erno. You write more about oh. Erno. So yeah, I wrote uh, the novel, The Moon and the Other, uh, which came out, and I mean, the Stories for Men came out, I think, in 2002 or three, and then yeah. uh, in 2017, this big novel, The Moon and the Other, really my my largest novel, uh, it picks up his story more or less 10 years after the end of that earlier story, and follows it forward, uh, um, and along with other characters. So it's set, uh, you know, this is this these stories are set on the moon in the 22nd century, uh, when um, um, and a lot of the action takes place in this society called the Society of Cousins, which is, a, I guess you could call it a matriarchy, but it's a society where women dominate the politics and, and the running of, of, uh, of the world, of that, that colon, colony. Um, and men are privileged in many ways, but uh, they don't uh, have political power. And so, uh, you know, that's an injustice. And, and there obviously are people who, uh, who object to that, but there are others who find it a uh, very uh, um, amenable. I mean, men have sort of given up what political privilege for sexual privilege. They <laughs> have as much sex as they want, as often as they want, with as many partners as they want, without any social stigma. Uh, also, they don't have any responsibility for taking care of the children. They can forget about that if they don't want to. And uh, and so I, I was thinking about you know how this might work again. Some people say, well, isn't that a terrible uh, dystopia? And I say, well, we're living in a terrible dystopia. <laughs> I, I mean, if you think that's a dystopia, what do you say about some of the things we have going on on the earth today? Uh, so, 
so, but it's not a utopia either. And, and uh, this is typical for me. I, I, I like to go into the thing and explore it without really knowing uh, or coming down too hard on one side or the other. It's really interesting because I feel sorry for comedians and science fiction writers now because you can't really satirize anything because it's already satire. And it's hard <laughs> to write dystopias because as you say, a good portion of the dystopias that are represented in science fiction are already here. Like the cur current events, just take Ukraine, for example, and what might happen because of Ukraine, whether like it's a, you could write about a tactical one kiloton, you know, and or, uh, or, you know, a uh, nuclear conflagrations, you know, set off by that. Yeah, I think we're living, it sometimes feels like we're living in a 1964 Philip K. Dick novel, uh, you know, uh, with a, a lot of, I mean, some things are seem would have been completely understandable to someone from the mid 60s. And other things today would seem very weird and strange and distorted and, and, and bizarre and, and, uh, uh, you know, Dick really sort of got this feeling that the future would be uh, multivalent <laughs> and, and strange things could happen. Yeah, whether you're reading Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep or you're reading Man in the High Castle, a lot of it's pretty much, you know, I have this friend, one of the guys who works at my bookstore, Mike, he and I read the same stuff. And for the past five, well, actually since the first Republican debates in 2015, when Trump's sitting in the middle and I'm going, we both go, you can't make this stuff up. But now we can't say it anymore because we've said it so many times that it's become a cliche and it's just, it's stupid of us to continue to say it. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, you know, it, it seemed that when Trump was running for president that just letting him say what he's going to say and act the way he does and explain express his, his ignorance or, or prejudice will, will uh, cause people to turn against him. And I think the, the horrible shock to so many of us was that, no, that's not the case. Uh, for many people, many, many people uh, find him persuasive and attractive. And, and that, you know, what do you do with that? Okay. Yeah, well, it's like H.L. Uh, Mencken said, the American people will eventually become so ignorant and stupid that they'll elect a complete moron, <laughs> which has... Well, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't think the thing is, but Trump is not a moron, okay? But no, he's he is, not. He is something that... You know, what is it? I've warned about, you know, this sort of uh, guy who knows how to manipulate other people, uh, kind of a success, very successful con man. Uh, and also he knows where the 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 levers uh, of the system are and how he can use it to his own means i don't think he imagines he would win that election frankly but uh you know he did he might so, not yeah. yeah the other thing about um that story stories for men is that you go down the rabbit hole you I mean you the the reading you've done has such depth and breadth that you know like stories for men who would even know it's a book but if you go down the rabbit hole you can read every one of those stories that Erno reads. Right, and right. They, they, it's, a, it's a real book, Stories for Men. Uh, it's a book that my uncle gave me. He moved into a new house and there were a couple of books in the closet and he was not a reader, so he gave the books to me. And one of them is Stories for Men, if you'll bear with me. I think I've got it right over here. Uh, oh gosh, I don't know where it is. Oh, well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like my library. <laughs> I, is, I, I'm generally in order, but uh, sometimes things get moved around. So, sorry. That's all right. But it's, my, it's an anthology was uh, uh, published in the 1930s. Yeah, it's like cancel culture. It's novels by Hemingway now, it, it's definitely cancel culture. You can't, yeah. you can't yeah. present those. And some of those stories are exactly the same way. The other thing, since you mentioned your uncle, is... Uh, which story is it where the house is, because you talk about it in your, on your uh, blog, which story is it where the house is like your, the way your father left things semi Oh, oh it's a, a spirit level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's pretty much exactly the house that I grew up in, uh, in my mind anyway, uh, when I wrote that story. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, in Buffalo, New York. Actually, it's in a suburb of Buffalo called uh, Orchard Park. Uh, and... Uh, uh, just a working class neighborhood of houses that were built 
in the 1950s, uh, you know, kind of ranch houses. My father built the house because he was a, he was a carpenter and uh, started from scratch, uh, built it from scratch, he did pretty much everything himself, uh, bricklaying, wiring, plastering, uh, carpentry, everything else uh, was done by his hand. So that was the house I grew up in, and it stayed in the family from 19... He started building it when I was born in 1950, and my sister lived in it. I haven't lived in Buffalo for many, many years, but she lived in it and sold it in 2011, I believe. So it's still there, but someone else lives there now. The other thing about that story, and I guess Ivar Avenue, is that you do a lot with... And this would be spoiling, so I'm not going to say anything, but you do a lot with the last paragraph. Like the last paragraph of that story where he calls his wife up and says, yeah, yeah. I have this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, both of those stories are about divorced, the main characters are divorced men of not young men and who, who have had uh, children and uh, are dealing with some of the things. I mean, it's weird. I, I always write uh, something that has an element of the fantastic in it. It's either science fiction or surreal fiction or maybe borderline horror or ghost story. But I, I, I always, uh, I almost always set it in in the very real world, and and I'm interested in the, in the characters are are very much, I intend them anyway uh, for the the vast majority of them to be um, understandable ordinary people, not not exceptional, not paragons. You won't see Captain Kirk in my stories, although I, mean, I suppose the Helvetican Renaissance has characters who might have, appear in a Star Trek story, but mostly not so much. Well, that was what I was going to bring up next was a Helvetican uh, story because, you know, if I'm placing that just that story alone, if I'm placing genres in my bookstore, where the heck would I place that? It, is it science? It's not science fiction. You know, I know you don't like no one likes to be put in a box of a genre, but what is it then? And just out of just as, as a. Well, uh, it, the the story I, I got asked to contribute to a, a anthology called the new space opera too so i i saw myself writing uh very much in the genre of space opera from the 30s and 40s and 50s uh space opera being uh sort of like star wars adventure fiction set in outer space in the distant future uh, multiple planets uh different cultures now i don't i don't have any aliens in my story but aside from that there's a, a you know this sort of distance a magical technology of the future uh all that stuff um, I, I wanted to put in the story. And it was fun to, to do that because it's not the kind of science fiction I normally write, but that's one of the most science fictional stories in the, in the collection. Uh, and, but again, what I like to do with that is to sort of play against the, the form. Okay, uh, uh, to me, the different kinds of science fiction or fantasy or horror or, or surrealism or magic realism, whatever, are like uh, forms that you do in, in poetry, like the sonnet or the villanelle or something like that. And they have certain things they give to you that you, you then bring your own originality to that. And you're working within parameters that are fairly fixed. You know, I'm gonna have spaceships, I'm gonna have adventure, I'm gonna have guys with blasters, I'm gonna have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, super science, uh, but, uh, but I'm going to also try to do something within that that I haven't seen before. So that story really has a lot to do with uh, religious belief and how, how uh, you know, whether you, uh, does religion exist? Does God exist? You know, uh, is God intervening in our lives? Uh, many people feel that our, uh, things that happen to us are not accidents. Uh, I had a Orson, Orson Scott Card said to me one time, he said, there are no accidents. I don't agree with him about that, but uh, but he felt that there were, nothing ever happens by accident, and so uh, I I was astonished by that because I feel that much of what happens in the world is by accident, and and so uh, uh, that got me thinking about that. I mean, and I grew up as a very serious uh, Roman Catholic boy, went to Catholic grade school and attended church every Sunday, and was serious about it. And in, in that world, you know, we, we are told that God rules everything. And, uh, you know, I grew up to not believe that. But 
I know that many people do. And so it, to me, the, the, the question about whether the things that happen to us are by accident or by, by our own, as a result of our own actions or by some intervention, by some higher spiritual force, uh, that's an interesting question. People have been asking that one as long as there have been people. And so uh, I thought, well, that'd be interesting to put that in a space opera. I don't think I've run into that before. So that's well, what I'm doing there. Let me try to paint you into a corner. So like the centerpiece of the book, I mean, Dark Ride, yes, but the centerpiece of the book to me, and then obviously you might've thought so too, is Pride and Prometheus. It, it is not science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> it's a historical, you know, all right, is Frankenstein a science fiction book? I think yeah. it's sort of yeah. kind, you know. But Pride and Prejudice is not, Vanity Fair is not, you know. Well, the other thing I am is an English professor, okay? I mean, I made my career uh, teaching literature, uh, mostly American literature and creative writing at North Carolina State University. I retired a few years ago. Uh, but uh, so I read a lot of books <laughs> and I, I love I love books. I love all kinds of books. You know, I mean, if you told me when I was 12 reading Astounding Science Fiction that you were gonna, I was going to become a huge fan of Jane Austen, I would have like looked at you, you as if you were crazy, I, uh, you know, but turned out I did, all right? And so uh, I thought, you know, that was a story where I wanted to crash together Pride and Prejudice and Frankenstein and see what, what sort of sparks would fly if I put those two things together in the same story. And, yeah. uh, and that, was, that was fun. <laughs> and it's funny too, because I like the way you said you tried reading you know, these gothic uh, zombie books, but you couldn't, yeah. I mean, you didn't say anything bad about it, but you just said you couldn't read it. And I can't stand those things. They're horrible. Well, and, I don't like them either. Yeah. Why, why don't but, you like them? Well, because it, they don't, there's, they act as if they're supposed to meld together, but they don't meld at all. There really is no way that you can suspend your disbelief. And then they're awkward. Uh, the wicked ones are the wicked books are okay, or like um, that movie uh, Maleficent, where where you flip a person. Those uh, kinds yeah. of things, like, Sleeping Beauty. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can live with that, but I can't live with those. They're just too stupid. Yeah, I mean uh, that that book, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, was was just a stunt. It was a joke, and he didn't even write most of it. He just took Jane Austen's book and stuck zombie scenes into it. So I felt like that wasn't, um, you know, if I, I've done a lot of stories where I enter the world of some other writer, you know, um, but I, I want to respect the original. Uh, even if I alter some things, I, I want to, uh, uh, you know, not treat it as if it were just a joke. Okay, uh, I want to take the situation seriously and the characters seriously, even if it's funny, I still want to uh, uh, have some respect for the for the original. And so that's, that's what I was trying to do with Pride and Prometheus. And I did 10 years later expand it into a novel, which I think works pretty well. But uh, it came out in 2018. You should look it up. <laughs> I know. I like the way you say that. But you said about other books too. So it's not like you're being vain. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, I, I forgot. Uh, I forgot the title of this book. Well, okay. So they end up, everyone ends up on the bus and they're all back, you know? Oh, right, right. That was the pure product. Yeah, that's. Still, yeah. yeah. And that's I, I I'm not saying anyone was my favorite, but I really like that. And the reason I like it is because, again, having owned a bookstore, I love when people don't really know. You don't really know. Was it him internally? You, you know, you don't really know for sure. Right. 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 No, that's right. And, and uh, that story, actually, I said that not Responsible Park and Lockett was the oldest story in the book, and it is the first one that was published, but that story came out in 1986, The Pure Product. I wrote the first draft of that in 1972. That's, that is by far the oldest story in the book, and it got rewritten about 30 times, and uh, they didn't have that ending on it originally. Uh, that last scene on the bus was not, not in the book, not in the story originally. So uh, I came to that much later. I had to rethink the whole thing repeatedly before it came to be that that particular ending. And yeah, I would call it, that story is kind of like a masterpiece. So that means you started it when you just graduated from college. I did. I, I wrote that over the Christmas vacation of 1970. 
too, when I uh, was at my, I was, that was my first year at the University of Kansas in grad school. And at the end of my first semester, I went home to Buffalo. I drove a thousand miles uh, from Lawrence, Kansas to Buffalo, New York. And so some of the driving scenes in that story were right out of my immediate memory of having driven across Missouri and Illinois and all that. So, yeah, that was, um, that, you know, there's several of them. Oh, the other thing is, there's two things that you really are hooked on. One, obviously, is time travel. And yeah. the other one is, yeah, I mean, it's not as hooked on, but it's Herman Melville and Moby Dick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I discovered Melville. Uh, it's funny. I, you know, I, I, I had to read Moby Dick when I was a sophomore in college, and I didn't really knock me out. Parts of it were, were great, but other parts I thought, whoa, what is this stuff? And then um, uh, later I had, I took a graduate seminar on Melville and Hawthorne and that I read it again and boy, it was really funny how, cause you read it when you're 19 and you think, oh no, this is not very good. What is this crap, you know? And then I read it when I'm 23, okay, or 24 and it's brilliant. And I thought, well, what happened? How did the book change? Did someone rewrite it? No, I changed. So, so, you know, that's a really good object lesson in what happens to you. Uh, uh, that as a person, if you change, you can find things that you didn't like when you were younger that you found you like. And then other things happen where you love something when you're 15 and you have some trouble with it when you're older. Uh, well, uh, I fell in love with Melville. And so I, I, I kept trying to do Melvillian things in my my stories. And so, uh, yeah, uh, Another Orphan is my first example of that. Uh, but uh, other things too, I mean, and Melville is a, a, one of the things, Melville here, I think of him as a kind of a quasi science fiction writer in that he was writing about the technology of the time and the whaling, all the whaling stuff there is all real stuff, okay? He was up to date on how that worked. He didn't really write science fiction, but but he, he used the, the form of the sea story to tell a story that has nothing, it's not just a sea story, it's about metaphysical, cosmic, uh, you know, this question of, of fate versus accident uh, is absolutely in uh, Moby Dick. You know, that question uh, of, uh, you know, who, what is the whale? Is it, rep is it just an animal or is it some kind of supernatural, uh, uh, force, or, or is it being uh, directed by God? Okay, and and uh, Ahab is you know obsessed with this question, and it, it, it interested me too. So you know, just hammering that gold piece in the in the top <laughs> of the, that was enough for me. It's funny because I interviewed this guy who was insane because he thought it's like why read Moby Dick? I think it was, and he basically said that. Any question you ever wanted answered, you can find in Moby Dick. <laughs> and I said, well, so even like stuff that's going on now, he goes, yep, it's in there. And the other thing he uh, said was, which was really weird was, he, and I have never found it in there. He says that Melville broke the fourth wall because there was one paragraph where he talked about looking out his window as he was writing, but I've never found that. But he said he did do it. And the other thing you said to remind is like that Mark Twain thing where when I was 16, my parents were complete idiots. And then when I was 21, <laughs> I was surprised how much they had learned in five years. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I uh, uh, the, the Melville thing, um, and it's, he still sticks with me in a way that, that uh, you know, I, I, uh, I keep circling around to it, although I haven't written a story that's directly Melville inspired in, in a long time. You know, one of the things that when I wrote Another Orphan, it, I wrote it, it was actually in my dissertation at the University of Kansas for my doctorate. And, oh. uh, um, but I, I, uh, I also at that time uh, was not taking course, I finished my coursework and I was working for a commodities wire service. So I, I knew about commodities trading in Chicago and elsewhere. And so I made my main character uh, a commodities analyst. And so this is how uh, autobiographical stuff will work its way into the story because I, you know, I wanna have real things in there to, to make things credible. So I, I tried to make this uh, commodities broker guy as real as I could, but then I thought, well, what happens if a commodities broker 
you know, wakes up and he's in the middle of Moby Dick and he knows it's just a book and he knows that everyone dies at the end except for Ishmael uh, and he's not Ishmael. So uh, I thought, well, that, that's cool. That's a, that could make a story, you know, and uh, I started following that along there. You know, another thing that's interesting, not to get a little too far off, is that you handle bodies well, especially female bodies, and sex well. Most science fiction writers don't like, they won't even go there. And when you go back to our time, whether it's uh, Ray Bradbury or Theodore Sturgeon or Clifford, they're not even going to any, for whatever reason, they won't go anywhere near that. And even in today's world, and it's the thing is you don't make it obviously not purient and you don't make it pornographic. It's just a matter of course. But the cool thing about it is it's very seldom that you see that done so naturally. I, I, well, I don't know. I, first time I ever tried to write a sex scene, it's like your mother's looking over your shoulder. All right. And it's not, it's not easy. Uh, you know, uh, I think sex is an important part of life. Uh, and um, I, I, I don't think it's in, in every, you know, it's not in every story, but it shows up in stories. And I, I think it's a, often a strong motivation. It uh, affects the way people interact with one another. It, 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 uh, not only that, you know, this whole idea of, of masculinity, which I explored in a couple of different stories, uh, sort of automatically gives rise to not, if you're thinking about what makes a man, that very much arises, uh, it, uh, 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 raises the issue of how does this person interact with women? Okay, not that every man is heterosexual or every woman is, but but this is a large part of our existence. And so, uh, you know, in order to think about what makes someone a man, a good man, a bad man, indifferent man, then you you pretty much automatically, at least at places that that comes into the story. And you said that your friend said that everything in human life is in Moby Dick. He was. Sex, yeah, he wrote the sex, book. Sex, yeah. Sex is not in Moby Dick, okay? <laughs> there's well, there's a little homoeroticism in there, but there's there uh, and uh, not not a not a relation between men and women too much. Well, another point is you do it gently too, which is just as sexy. Would like when in in Dark Ride when you're saying the dandy is out there looking for a well turned ankle, you know, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if you've get, been to an amusement park, uh, you know, guys and their girlfriends are there and you know that there's a subtext going on at least frequently. Uh, uh, if you go to the beach, whatever, there, sex is in the air. Uh, and so, uh, and I don't think people were really that different 100 or 150 years ago. Otherwise yeah. we wouldn't be here. <laughs> the hard, you know, the hardest thing is, is you're with your partner, your wife, whatever. And you pass a really nice looking girl. As a guy, you, you turn, you have to turn your neck around. And it's really hard not to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's an interesting thing. I mean, that men are, maybe not all men are, but many, most men are, you know, they're interested in sex a lot. Okay. And and that uh uh you know is a is a factor in their behavior or in their thought, uh more than uh maybe it needs to be <laughs> uh, now and then well, but also that's why we're here too i mean although right, this right, everything right. we're saying is kind of cancel culture now which is you know it, it's so weird to me because you got to be very careful because well i don't i don't care if i'm careful i don't care what happens with regard to that but all the stuff we're treading on now is close to the edge of something but i don't know why anymore well I mean, and i think that you know it is actually very interesting to think about i mean young people mostly young people i mean they have a different view and things that that old dudes like us grew up with are not what they consider to be um, a good way to be and so i think that it's natural for these things to change over time it is difficult for us to try to figure out okay to what degree do i think you know they're absolutely on to something right and it's it's education for me to to learn about that or to what degree do i feel they're over 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 reacting or overstating the case uh That's you know i think about my stories and going through all these stories to put them in the book i thought geez well how is some of this stuff going to come across to modern readers will they find it objectionable and uh you know this is a, a, a problem for any writer it seems to me that 
if mores change over time, something you thought was perfectly uh, natural and ordinary becomes uh, objectionable. And of course, we see this in a lot of books, all right? Uh, um, so how do we deal with that? And as a, a teacher, it seems to me those are opportunities for us to try to understand the past. But I think a lot of people today just want to reject it. They don't. They don't. They don't really want to have any contact with it because it's it's wrong, and and that that uh, you know uh, they don't want to have to deal with things that they think are wrong. And um, I, I, I think it's under it's interesting to think about how did why did people feel that way? To what degree do that people still feel that way? Uh, and and what you know what what can we do about it if if anything so that was why i brought up the idea of the book club i mean in our book clubs which i've said this before sometimes i call them fight club um huh. it's you know if, if you have me 70 year old and then someone in the book club a woman who's like 22 yeah this is where you can clearly see that, that either we don't understand each other we're not willing to listen to one another and then sometimes we do compromise or sometimes we understand where we're going, but it can be, it's extremely problematic. And also it could be offensive, you know? So, yeah. Well, that, that, that is, that is, is tough when, you know, you have offended someone deeply and uh, you know, I, I, as a teacher, one of the things I thought as I approached retirement was that I was, they probably needed a younger person in the classroom than me, uh, you know, was, but yeah, on the other hand, yeah. I learned an awful lot from my students, you know, in their writing. I, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated business. I don't know. It's funny uh, talking about being old, because when I saw that you referenced The Clash and the Cadillac song, I was going, well, that's cool. He's doing some current stuff. And then I realized, wait a minute, that's like <laughs> <laughs> 19, 1980, pal, okay? <laughs> no, 1979. And I know, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. He's writing about stuff that's going on now. And then I go, oh, no, I'm completely wrong. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, in that story, there's this guy who's in his 50s, all right, who's, you know, driving his car and listening to The Clash on the radio and, you know, writing, but he's he's not, you know, 26, okay? He's he's 56, all right? And so that, that uh, uh, you know, that it's easy to forget that, yeah, yeah. So what do you think of all these? Well, first of all, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's introduction was great, and I'm sure you're very honored by it because I, I, I was very honored by it, and I'm, you know, I've, I, I thought it, I was really lucky to have him do that intro. Yeah, but okay, so what he said and what I thought, how do you feel about it? You know, okay, being compared to people like Kafka or Calvino or Borges, do you see it? Do, is it something you? I, I, well, I, I'm honored to be mentioned in the same sentence as those guys. Uh, I have read all those guys and been influenced by them. And Kafka is one of my very favorite writers. And, and also uh, um, uh, Borges, again, both of them really, uh, I actually consciously had Kafka in mind for some of these stories, all right? Like the lecturer, okay? Uh, and, and so uh, the lecturer to me uh, comes out as so, so thinking about stories like uh, The Hunger Artist or A Hunger Artist by Kafka. And so, uh, you know, that to me is, uh, they're an inspiration to me. Now I am coming sort of out of the genre world, but I, I, it doesn't seem to me incompatible for me to uh, claim to be influenced by both Robert Heinlein and Jorge Luis Borges. Okay, uh, that that a, a person can can uh, can find inspiration in both of those those writers. So I I, I would I, I I'm very honored that Stan would mention that. But he already we we're friends from 1982. We met. Okay, so uh, you know he knows I read all those guys. <laughs> you mentioned when you mentioned the hunger artist because I was listening to Fire Sign right before this. Ah, like, okay, it's like the kid, the guy who goes. Well, how, what do you attribute your longevity to? And he goes, I don't eat. And they goes, That's a, <laughs> he goes, but it hasn't affected my appetite. Appetite, yes. Yeah, well, now the Fireside Theater, which is, you now that guys of our generation know what that is, but it's so Nobody obscure. else does. No Nobody else does. But, uh, but they had all kinds of, I mean, they're, one of their uh, 
comedy albums. One of their not really comedy albums. The albums has a, a ends off where the character switches into Molly Bloom's soliloquy from the end of Ulysses in right. the middle you know, of. I, yes, I will. This, yeah. So it's you know. So in other words, they're taking high culture and fusing it with this kind of San Francisco druggy culture that that they came out of. Okay. And uh, so to me, that's. I've always liked that since I was a young man that to take things that don't belong together and 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 mix them up and see how you can make them work together and and the, and the, the key there is to make them work, not just like slam them together with not with without even thinking about it, but to somehow see what lines of, of affinity there are between them, you know. So you 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 can, uh, uh, you know. I guess it just becomes more interesting when you when you you take it seriously and go into it. Although I also, um, I I I am very. Uh, I'm very much a fan of comedy. And so not there, even in my most serious stories, I try to have some things that are sort of little jokes or, or satirical bits that, that don't, uh, you know, don't necessarily uh, cause a belly laugh, but, but you, you look at things a little funny. So, so in the, the last story, the dark ride in there, uh, you know, I have little, I mean, there you go. That's uh, set in 1901. And it's, in some ways, it's, it's a historical fiction. But I also have these scenes that take place on the moon. <laughs> and, and in the moon side of that story, I tried to write a pulp story from, from uh, you know, the early 20th century pulp magazines where, with the, the absurdities of those, of those uh, 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 times. Uh, and and you know doing things like having these uh, the lethal uh, lunar uh, police uh, are insectoid creatures that are pink, and then in the lethal human police on Earth in that part of the story are the Pinkertons. So uh, making them pink was just my little joke about about uh, that that sort of. Thing. Well, it's funny because as to the pulp act aspect of it, no pun intended, you know. The it's so classic the way he takes the pole and hits them and their skulls just shatter. <laughs> he doesn't have to hit them 10 times. They just fall apart because of the lunar gravity and all. <laughs> but uh, it was funny because I'll, this is the last time I'll bring it up about genre things. But it's weird when you when you listen to either that, that fire sign or uh, all hail Marx and Lenin, it, it is almost like science fiction. It, it almost is, but it's but it's not. But it, you know, it does seem that way, especially when they're melding together like six different things at one time, like like the mucklucks and this cornstarch and stuff like that. You know, right, right. And uh, you know, I I recommend those of you who don't know the Firesign Theater might try to look them up. Okay, they did a number of albums. They were long playing albums in the mid seventies, mid to late seventies that were sort of stream of consciousness comedy routines and satirical. Uh, things that generally flow from one thing to the next. They might have some plot framework, but it was very, uh, one of them is like a hard-boiled detective story. Another one is like a uh, Andy Hardy comedy set in the 1940s. And, and uh, um, but then they go in strange places. And to me, that, that has always appealed to me, okay? That the kind of surrealism has always been, uh, you know, here I, on the one hand, I like, science and i'm interested in science i'd have a degree in physics but on the other hand i'm interested in the in the surreal where you take the strange and you put it into the ordinary uh or you mix the things together that that to me is always illuminating and it, it, it someone asked me once back in the 80s uh and you know, i was hired by nc state to be uh, a teacher of writing and and literature but uh, one of my other uh professor colleagues uh, older than, than I, uh, picked up one of my early stories and read some of my stories and, and said, came to me and said, John, you know, you, you write really quite well. <laughs> it was, he was sort of surprised at that. And he said, you know, you write well enough, you don't have to write science fiction or fantasy. And, and I did not like spit in his eye, but, you know, the assumption was that if you were a good writer, you wouldn't write that crap. Okay, that 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 that's only uh, people who write that are playing in the, in the kiddie pool, okay, in the sandbox. And if they once they grow up, they come out of the sandbox and they don't ever mess with those toys again. 
And uh, from my mind, that's a, a extremely, one, ignorant, and two, condescending attitude, because people have been writing science fiction at the highest level of literary ambition since H.G. Wells. Okay, so, so uh, um, to say that, uh, you know, if you're a good writer, you know, you're a good enough writer, you don't have to write that crap. Uh, it, it made me feel like I, I, um, I was going to, I was going to, my whole idea in my career was to write as well as I could within the different genres and uh, force the world to recognize that this stuff could be serious uh, uh, literature, if you want to call it with a, a capital L. Uh, unfortunately that, and it, I think it's happened sort of, you, you see books every year now on a bestseller list that are, would have been published as science fiction 50 years ago, you know, Station Eleven, okay. Uh, um, but but uh, now they're published as regular novels and you know, they're called anti-utopian um, novels or something like that, dystopias or, and, and uh, so that, that, that this kind of stuff has gained some literary acceptance. But for people like me who started out in the pulp magazines, you can't cross that, that barrier. Uh, you, you've been, I think you've been uh, tarred with the brush of, 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 you know, adolescent fiction. And that's just, you know, what you are. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't make the work any less. I've come around to feel that, well, the work is what it is. And um, that's, that's okay. And anyone who takes the time to read it will either like it or not like it. And I think those things in there that adult people will enjoy. Uh, yeah, so like, Emily's a good example. And I interviewed her for Station Eleven. And then the other one is, which is more straight, well, it's not even science fiction, The Martian by Andy Weir. And I interviewed him on that. Right, right. And the reason why yeah. it's like you're saying you're a scientist, the science is really good in The Martian. And that's what makes it good. So yeah, he really uh, got all the science as accurate as he possibly could uh, yeah. about Mars, about space travel, all that stuff. So, well, you know, uh, it doesn't seem to me that science fiction necessarily means that the science has to be wrong. Uh, it can be speculative, perhaps, or it can be, uh, there's science fiction where the science is completely, uh, uh, you know, as, as we know it today. But I mean, but then there are other things in science fiction that, you know, you take an idea that's been around and you mentioned that I like time travel stories. I've written a number of time travel stories and Time travel, you know, technically, I guess if you study, uh, you know, Einsteinian physics, it's possible to make a wormhole that would take you back in time. But the way it's used in stories and the way it, it's done in stories is, is pretty much next to impossible. So, so does that mean you can't write time travel? Well, it's a way of um, thinking about things. Yeah, and uh, now actually, because... I was going to say, because Go now, because of the metaverse concept, and you actually use it in a way because you can't come back, you know, you can't come back exactly. to the same. Yeah. yeah so that parallel worlds, yeah, the, the uh, many worlds uh, quantum theory, yeah. That's, yeah, that, that's a lot of authors now off the hook to a certain extent, because you can just say yeah. that and you're done. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good place to end. I mean, uh, like I said, we could, we could have gone through every story, but we went, we went through a good number of them. That was pretty good. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we've been talking with John Kessel, whose latest re release is The Dark Ride, the best short fiction of John Kessel. It'll be published by Subterranean Press, and um, it'll be released on June 1st. And thanks so much, John, for being here. This was great. Thank you, Sam. I've enjoyed talking with you. I hope I didn't uh, talk too fast. I get, get excited sometimes. No, it was good. I talked too much. <laughs> <laughs> you I talked too much. But anyway, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Thanks.